Welcome to the Restitute Orbis channel, and thank you for joining me for our exploration in City on the Edge of Forever. We return to Des Moines to complete an in-depth look at one of the most intriguing cities that we've ever looked at when it comes to an on-the-ground exploration. Now, there are many cities that have been worthy of follow-up explorations, but why do I return to Des Moines? For whatever reason, the anomalies in Des Moines make it very fitting of the Sobercast City on the Edge of Forever, definitely after that original series Star Trek episode. And as we look at the Soldier and Sailor's Monument, the great column next to the Capitol dedicated to the Iowa veterans of the Civil War, and many other monuments that we see dedicated to Iowa politicians from the early 20th century, and finally, we turn our gaze to the Iowa State Capitol. We're going to take a closer look both at the Iowa State Capitol and Des Moines to complete our explorations of this very unique city. I'm no sorcerer, but I'll gladly test your steel, old friend. We return to our bird's eye view map to look at some map anomalies. Now, you may recall that this bird's eye view map was composed in 1868, and Iowa had not been a state very long, and Des Moines had not been a city or the state capital very long. We have Lincoln School here, so we're told, and we do have an image of it. We also have the temporary state capital, and we see a picture of the original state capital in Iowa City that they relocated. We also have this U.S. courthouse and post office from 1871 to 1968, and then the original Polk County Courthouse, which there was a picture of in the current Polk County Courthouse, but you're not allowed to take pictures in the current Polk County Courthouse. Look at the layout and the pattern of the streets here in Des Moines at this time, and we can see that it seems to be arrayed along the Des Moines River, and that makes sense. And then we also have the four bridges that we use to reference ourselves, and this is the location of the plot of land where the current Iowa State Capitol is. Oddly enough, it seems to have already been designated as a plot of land, and of course that's what we're, we'll be told, and that's what the bird's eye view map represents to us. There's a temporary state capitol. And we also remind ourselves of how the streets flow into the river, and yet if you look at the streets on the upper right corner, you notice that they seem to run a different direction. Here's the Polk County Courthouse, and there's a picture of the current Polk County Courthouse. This is the city core of Des Moines as it stands today, and we have an older image from the 1950s, and this is Lincoln School, and we see where it sits on the bird's eye view map. The current Lincoln School is far to the south of the city core of Des Moines at this time. Looking at the rest of the bird's eye view map, though, we have to remember that this is merely a representation that someone drew this, but how accurate is this, we have to wonder. For example, is this street grand, and is this... Terrace Hill, the current governor's residence. Very odd that there's such a wonderful and paramount edifice depicted on the distant ridgeline. And certainly that would have to be the edifice that would only match it. Here are the four bridges that go across the Des Moines River. And up here we have what we're told in the key is Iowa Central College, although there are no roads leading up to it. Quite an intriguing building if it's depicted as it really was. Well, maybe they just walked the wood out and decided to build the foundation out there. I mean, it was the 19th century, so there's no doubt they had to rough it with limited logistics. And here in this distant area, we have what is now occupied by Des Moines, Beavertown, and if you go further up on the map, you end up in what's now Urbandale. Here in this other current map of Des Moines, we see the layout of the Capitol streets, and going back to what I was saying earlier, notice how these streets all seem to run based on the river. But then when you look in the upper left side of the map, you can see that they run north, south, east, west. Very interesting and a picture of the city core, the state capital, and where they're laid out. And as you look closer in the map, you can get a better feel for the city core and how everything's arranged on the river. And so it does give the indication that yes, indeed, the city was originally built on the river. We see Terrace Hill again off of Grand Avenue. But why is it that it seemed that even in the bird's eye view, they already knew that they wanted to change the alignment of the streets, where we saw that the primary streets, which in most of Des Moines, run north-south or east-west directly, unlike the streets of the downtown and the city core, which are aligned off the river. Very intriguing when we think about this. Did they really have this city that well planned out, that far in advance? And keep in mind, we had all those floods in the 1850s and all those other challenges. And, of course, that very nice teacher who gave her honest opinion of Des Moines. And if you're curious to hear that, then watch on to the Des Moines video that follows this one. But looking at all these city blocks, we have what appears to be a very dense city core. And yet, we know that Des Moines is a city that grew up very rapidly. There really wasn't much there prior to 1840, aside from a fort. 
And we can see where Des Moines is located within the greater Iowa area. And you can see Iowa City off to the right. And going back into Des Moines, we'll take a look. And where we have the map marked is the city core, Drake University. And then we have Terrace Hill marked, which we've seen in the other bird's eye view maps. There's the Iowa State Capitol. And this runs down into the river. And here we have some other old world buildings that we will be exploring as part of this exploration. When you look very closely, though, here at Grand Avenue, you can see where this runs to Terrace Hill. This is the governor's residence, and we'll take a brief look at that. We can see that the city seems to be very well arranged, but is this really from a plan in the 1840s, 1850s, or was this already in existence? And indeed, when we change to our aerial footage, we can get a good idea for how everything's very well laid out, starting with that very impressive state capital, that palace, that regional forum from a previous civilization, and the wonderful works of the parkway, and then we see the Soldier and Sailors Monument that we looked at, and then that other monument. And let's not forget the Iowa Judicial Branch Building, where the Iowa Supreme Court meets, since they no longer meet in the Iowa State Capitol. But we will look at that area where they used to meet in the Iowa State Capitol. Here we have the Polk County Courthouse. And this is really the start of what they call the court area in Des Moines. But really it's the city core when we look at it. And we do have some impressive old world buildings such as the Equitable Building. And we have some others. The Surety Hotel which was originally the Savings and Loan Building. And known by a slew of other names as they tended to be. We'll take a look at some of these buildings. Some of them, we're told, are Gothic Revival. Others are Art Deco buildings. And we see the usual tactic of surrounding them with our lovely, more modern buildings. And yes, I'm being sarcastic. And then we see this Polk County Administration building. We'll be taking a close look at that as well. Supposedly built in the 1930s or so, we're told. And yet we see some very interesting touches of neoclassical architecture in that as well. When you zoom out and you go to the northwest of the city core, you come to Drake University. Drake University was an early established university in Des Moines, Iowa, named after Francis Marion Drake, a Iowa Civil War officer and governor of Iowa. And we'll take a look at the old main building. Drake is in the large, shitty portion of Des Moines. And when we look at the overall arrangement of the streets, here's what I was referring to earlier, where we see that the, we have the streets that are arranged on the river, and then we have the north-south streets. The Iowa State Capitol, a fourth era Tartarian regional forum, possibly. And recall that we use the term Tartaria merely to refer to the fourth era civilization. And now we go to the interior of the Iowa State Capitol. Every single time that I go into this building, I find myself overcome by an immense surge of energy and positive feeling, and maybe that's just me. Every single structure within this building, every column, every pillar, every stairway, made of 29 different types of marble, reflecting granite, sandstone, limestone, impressive construction everywhere that the eye can see. There is no detail that is overlooked within this building. And despite all the other explorations that we've done through the last year on this channel, I am still overcome by amazement and inspiration looking at the Iowa State Capitol, looking at the fine details and all the construction, wondering what is this material really? Is it what we're told it is? Or is it something even more advanced? Because as I said, you will not come across anything that's any sort of cheap facading. You will not hear anything that sounds hollow as you go through this, what we're told, State Capitol building, but may have been something much more and much greater in the distant past. Indeed, as we look at it, we're transformed to another area, such as when I walked into the building and noticing how the temperature instantly increased from 29 degrees to 70 degrees, and there was not an area in this building. It was cold. Here we have a commemoration to women suffragists, and yet when you actually look at the women being depicted on this, do these really look like women who were ever deprived of the right to vote? To me, these look like women who were always leaders and were never deceived on what the right to vote really is. In other words, they always had their own power, and that's what's being depicted in that picture. Yes, here we have our HVAC system. It looks like a giant radiator, and you can see that there are several around this entryway room with the intricate and geometrical precision in the architecture and the beauty of all the columns leading up to the ceiling. Everywhere you look within this building, you are completely taken aback by what you see, a pediment above every single door great columns and pillars, and every single one displaying the same nature of being completely and fully built through. 
You don't need any sort of special scale or someone else to tell you what the hardness of all the structures within this impressive structure are. And despite our many construction photos that we've looked at, we don't have a single construction photo that shows us how they managed to erect all these impressive columns within this immense capital dome. And indeed, we have these gold statues that we have representations for and we're given an explanation for. But we have to ask, are those the actual representations and original intentions of these statues? If they are, and if it was our civilization that did build this building, as we're told that it is, then what does that speak towards our current capability? Indeed, towards the end of this exploration, we'll compare the Iowa State Capitol from the latter portion of the 19th century to a building erected in the latter portion of the 20th century. And here, when you feel the top of, well, really what they have are granite tables on top of these radiator devices, they're always emanating heat. It's very warm and very comfortable, despite all the immense volume of space within this impressive palace, this regional forum, and we can come up with many different names. Here we see the old room where the Iowa Supreme Court used to meet. And even looking at the hinges of these doors, we can see intricate and geometric detail. Very unique symbols, and I just show my hand there to give you an idea as to how large this door hinge really is. Very impressive, and then looking inside here at the room where the Supreme Court of Iowa used to meet. And we can see that this is most certainly a room that's worthy of any of the exercising of what we're told is the power of justice, because of the beauty within this room. And in the follow-up video, you'll see the exploration of the current building where the Iowa Judicial Branch or the Iowa Supreme Court meets. And I dare say it's no comparison, but that's just my opinion. Make of it what you will. Here we have these impressive stairs with these very unique lamps. Very, very intriguing looking at some of the designs and intricacies on these lamps. And then we also see it on this other lamp as well. Two stairways with a lot of detailing, immense tiles, and even a very beautiful chandelier. The room is very well lit, and I know people have asked me about the HVAC or what we come across, and that's why I focused on the radiators. I'll also state that there are no bathrooms that are obviously displayed or of easy access. Now they're there, but they almost seem to be an afterthought in this immense building. And we can certainly speculate in terms of what its original purposes were. But when you examine all the architecture and the columns within this building, look at how well formed this particular column is. And consider the fact that we're told that this has been there since sometime from 1871 to 1886. And they were able to form columns like this with a sort of material. And if you go to the state capitol yourself, and if you examine all of these wonderful structures and gaze upon these impressive statues with your own eyes, you'll probably find yourself filled with the same feeling that I was. Some sort of feeling of inspiration, almost as though you're transported to a different land. Because when you go into the state capitol, this does not feel like this is something that's reflecting our current society or our civilization. I was finally able to gain access to the library. Interior access to the library in the state capitol. We're told this is one of the very largest law libraries in the United States. And I certainly have my questions about what sort of works are actually available and what's still available within this library. In my previous experience in academia, I'm certainly well aware of the tendency we have of running out of room for maintaining books, and therefore books have to be removed from circulation. Looking at the impressive ceiling and the spiral staircases, we can see once again the design of an immense chamber to store all these books, something that defies our ability to explain. Now the tour guide was doing their best, giving an explanation of how supposedly the state capitol in Michigan had something to do with the construction of this very impressive interior, and I simply listened, and I enjoyed myself just by immersing my mind in all the ideas and all the potential realities that are reflected within this particular library. And once again, the temperature in this library was very comfortable. It was a very cool high 20 degrees Fahrenheit outside, and yet a very comfortable 70 degrees in every single room, in every single space within this immense Capitol building. Very impressive, and a very stunning achievement for a building that was constructed from 1871 to 1886. And yes, as if you need any further reminder, 
The Iowa State Capitol is also a true old world building because it's a wedding venue. You know, wedding picture venue. Ah, yes, on the mosaic here we see smokestacks and a very interesting obelisk. We're told that the building represented on these images is the Iowa State Capitol in the middle, and then off to the right they have the original State Capitol in Iowa City. At least that's what we're told. But there's never been any sort of gigantic obelisk present in Iowa that we know of, and yet it's depicted on this very impressive mosaic. I suppose these individuals represent Iowans from the 19th century. Now I know we'll be told that this is an idealized art image and that these are supposed to be representations of the spirit of these various functions of government or various aspects of government. At least that's what we'll be informed. And there's that very unique obelisk again. And even looking at this here, this image that we're told is defense. There's something very unique about the individuals depicted on this. Now this may full well be a work of art that was done by our civilization to really reflect the great spirits and pride that the people of Iowa have. But when you look at the size and immensity of this state capital, looking at the top of these columns and these pillars and seeing the decorative detail, you can tell that whoever actually did build this building took a lot of time and put a lot of pride into every single detail of construction from the skylight, the ceiling, the walls, to the floor. There is nothing within this entire structure that is facading. There is nothing that is cheap, and there is nothing that does not seek to inspire the imagination. Even here in the Iowa Senate Assembly Room, looking up towards the ceiling. And let us recall that we were told that this wonderful edifice nearly perished in a fire in the early 20th century. They're always doing renovations on it, or so we're told, but I'm often wondering if they're simply doing some sort of assessment to ascertain, perhaps, if this wonderful structure may have some other uses, or perhaps its vulnerabilities in the future. I'm not saying that's exactly what's happening, but I always find it intriguing that they're constantly doing renovation on this structure that, if you visit it in person, you have to wonder how there's anything within the structure that would ever require any sort of renovation because the columns, the pillars, the walls, everything appears original. And everything appears as though it's going to last for another 10,000 years without fail, without issue. Going back to this banister with this very intricate statue on top of it, I wanted to take a look again at some of the symbolism within this cornucopia. And I noticed these two lizard reptile creatures that appear to be fighting hidden within this Iowa harvest. What exactly does this represent? And I looked at this before in the very first exploration on the channel. Is there something that's hidden? Is there a hidden symbol within this? A warning of some sort, in terms of what we'll find in the bountiful harvests. And on the other banister, we see less pernicious and more inspiring creatures depicted on the cornucopia of fruit and the harvest with pumpkins, and many other things. But yet, if you look in the details, you'll find that there are other disturbing images within this. Very intriguing. What exactly is your take on this? Please let me know in the comments. I'm intrigued to know what other perceptions we could have on this unique symbolism. And of course, we have a plaque that gives us everything that we need concerning the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi and dedicated in memory of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And then I'll show another image here of what looks to be a snake that I cited within the cornucopia. Many interesting symbols and many interesting representations in this impressive state capitol building. What are your thoughts on it? And now we go to Lincoln High School. This is south of the city core. Interestingly enough, we have another one of these high schools that just happens to resemble a castle. And I don't mean to be cliche, but that's what it looks like to me. And we think about how a high school functions, and I remember when I was in high school, and most of the time when you're a student, you tend not to pay attention to the exterior too much. You're simply spending your whole day in the building, in your classes, and then when you leave, you leave. But very interesting symbols that we have depicted on this building with many pediments and great details to construction. And you might recall that this is another wonder that we have in terms of when it was actually constructed, whether it was the 1930s or some other time frame entirely. And that's the reason why I refer to Des Moines, Iowa being the city on the edge of forever. Is this really a reflection of an older civilization, or is this simply a nexus of alternate realities, different timelines? Sometimes I'm not sure myself. I mean, I know which theory I pursue the most, but it's always intriguing when you see this. 
Here we even have what appears to be a bit of a battlement. I mean, how can you not say that this is a castle, complete with a gate? And yet all the intricate detail in the main entryway. All the way up to the windows, and what exactly is this material? Is this the actual Portland cement? Well, if it is, it seems to be holding up quite well for being Portland cement. And you can see that this is a larger compound than might first meet the eye. Indeed, going and looking in depth, you can see that this is actually a very large compound with many different structures and many different ornamentations and details above every single window. And yet the brick is very fine with unique patterns on each of the walls. A very well-constructed and inspiring structure, and all this for a high school? And now we go to Drake, Old Main, and as I said, this is in the large, shitty portion of Des Moines, Iowa. And here we have the Old Main Building. Now, not every university retains its original Old Main Building, but Drake University has. Drake University named after Francis Marion Drake, an Iowa Civil War officer who had a very interesting career. And eventually he rose to become governor of Iowa, with some other enterprises in between. Very interesting portion of town here in Des Moines that we're in, uh, northwest of the city core. And as I said, it's the large, shitty portion of Des Moines. And yet we still have this very impressive old main building, where it's designated as Drake University, a very fine sign. Yet you can see a contrast with even finer symbols behind the very fine sign. Sarcasm meter at a thousand. It is a wondrous structure, though, and I'm always impressed when I see those archways of blocks that they have constructed there. And looking at the side of the old main building, we can see there's a lot of depth to it and a very interesting layout in its construction. We'll be told that this is from the early 1880s, and perhaps we could believe that. And we could also believe that every state hospital that's in the middle of nowhere I was just there. Well, let's go to Terrace Hill. This is where the governor's residence is located, and access to the governor's residence is limited, but I did want to show this footage to give you an idea of just how large Terrace Hill really is, because I don't believe the pictures did it justice. How fitting that it's located on a street that's made out of brick, and obviously it's never been redone at any point in time. No, I'm not close friends with Kim Reynolds, so I was not invited in for dinner or coffee at any point in time, but it is a very nice governor's residence. Very interesting that it's on this hill, and recall how we saw that building depicted on the large hill. Now we go to the Polk County Courthouse, and there are no pictures allowed inside the Polk County Courthouse. It replaced an earlier courthouse, which there was a picture on the inside of the earlier courthouse, but I've been unable to locate it. It's quite an impressive structure, and we're told it's built in the early 20th century. We can see many different pediments and pillars integrated within the walls and then separate columns. And keep in mind, this is only a few blocks away from the very impressive Iowa State Capitol that we just looked at. Now you might be wondering why is it we're not allowed to take photos inside and yet we're invited to take photos on the inside of the Iowa State Capitol building. I suspect that there's a reason they do that and it's to draw attention actually away from the Iowa State Capitol building. Yes, if you go down this road, you'll eventually come to the Iowa State Capitol building. A little obscured by the buildings here, but this gives you an idea of the city core of Des Moines, which is located around the Polk County Courthouse. Looking closer at the Polk County Courthouse, we do see some very intriguing figures, though, above both of the windows. And again, are we to really believe that this is just a simple Portland cement? We'll be told that this is a limestone, a sandstone, and if you're curious, watch on to the following videos where we looked at the historical account of the building. Let's take a look at the Savings and Loan Building, built 1913. And isn't this a very impressive structure for 1913 in Des Moines, Iowa? Decorations at the bottom floors all the way up to the top floors. A very impressive achievement for that time frame, and even the building next to it's impressive, and we can even get our first look at the Equitable Building. We can see that there seems to be a different uh, mentality with these buildings, and now we look at the original Des Moines Savings and Loan Bank, and now we look closer at the Equitable Building, built in 1924. Very impressive detailing, and what are those supposed to be? Elves that are holding the building up? Quite an interesting depiction for the mid-1920s in Des Moines. That we have elves managing to uplift the building with wondrous decorative detail on it. And here we even see that the front of the Des Moines Equitable Building has a very impressive entryway. And again, we can see the elves in each of the little columns and the pillars. Very impressive. 
and even this decoration above both of the main entry doors. What exactly is this reflecting? And what's the main material on this? And of course we have another plaque that gives us what the original origin of the building is. Ask no questions, whatever you do. And here we have another impressive and interesting building that seems to be from the Art Deco era that's managed to survive in the downtown of Des Moines. And yet they're surrounded by many of our postmodern constructions that seem to be designed to conceal the wonderful beauty of these original buildings. And even here in what we see what used to be a public library in Des Moines, and it's been repurposed as the World Food Prize building. Very intriguing. But yet we can see some of the intricacies of more advanced construction that seems to be reflected in this building. They may not always make the most sense, but it's present. And finally, we look at this very interesting, what we're told is an administration building for Polk County because that Polk County courthouse is not impressive enough. If you're going to do any of your administration affairs in Polk County, you do it in this building. Another one built in the 1930s or so, we're told, where they showed the classical, neoclassical architecture. And finally, I'll leave you with some footage from the 801 Grand Building from the late 1980s. And if you go around and you do my little tests that I do and actually ascertain what the walls are, you might be surprised, especially if you go down there right after going to the Iowa State Capitol and taking a close look at what appears to be fine materials. I assure you that you'll realize there's a vast difference between this 801 Grand Building and the Iowa State Capitol. I invite you to join me as we continue looking at some other explorations of Iowa, looking closer at Des Moines and then looking at some other areas where there's some very unique structures that reflect the old world civilization. I'd also like to send out my best wishes to John Levi, one of the individuals responsible for inspiring me to do this channel. Once more, I must ride with my knights to defend what was and the dream of what could be. Welcome to the Rest of the Orbis channel. Today we're exploring Des Moines, the Tartarian city of the monks. Des Moines, the location of building number one for the channel's comparison for all buildings. And here we're not looking at building number one, we're looking at the Polk County Courthouse. We've explored it before in the video Midwest Palaces. Des Moines has many enigmatic remains of wondrous buildings from the fourth era civilization, such as this building in the downtown. Now as we conduct this exploration, we're going to find out that Des Moines has had the unfortunate tragedy of losing many of its great buildings. And yet at the same time, some of the most wondrous buildings across the land just happen to be preserved in this one city, such as building number one, the Iowa State Capitol the only five-dome state capital in the United States. In my humble opinion, there is no other capital that matches this state capital. We've been on the inside of it before. It was the first full exploration that the channel conducted, and we saw the unbelievable beauty and detailed ornate decorations within a state capital in a state that is well known for its corn. And we're going to take a closer look at the account of both the capital and the city of Des Moines. When you look at all the beauty, you can also see that it contains many different materials, and I can assure you, just as I did in that original video, that everything in the state capitol is solid and real. There is no facading, there is nothing here that is cheap, and there is nothing here that was done in a time or budget saving manner. And keep in mind, we're told that this impressive and beautiful state capitol was built in 1871 to 1886. And you can see gold on the outside of the dome, and gold on the inside of the dome, and columns. Let's not forget that it has 29 different types of marble, and you can see some of those marbles expressed here in this banister. You really get the idea of the fact that this is truly a palace. 
And the reason we had to wait to do our full exploration of Des Moines was we had to look at some of the incredible edifices in places such as the Vatican in Rome, St. Petersburg in Moscow in Russia. And yet here in this state capital in Iowa, we can see the same decorative and detailed ornamentation in this capital that matches the very finest of what we saw when we were looking at St. Petersburg, Moscow, the Vatican, and Prague. And now we see it here. The story of Des Moines. Fort Des Moines founded 1843 and it was abandoned. It was refounded in 1846, flooded in 1851. A school teacher described it as a crappy city. Therefore, in 1857, the state decided to make it the state capital. Look, it's the 19th century. If you can't build a capital city in a place where there is no capital city, it's just not worth doing. Let's take a look at this early bird's eye view map of Des Moines. So this is 1868. And here we have what is the Lincoln Public School and there is an image of it and it looks to be the same building. Very intriguing. And then here we have the temporary state capitol. They moved out of that dump in Iowa City in 1857 on the left to the nice building on the right. It was a temporary state capitol until they built the main state capitol, or so we're told. We have this U.S. courthouse and post office, and that would be the same building with a little tower on it. We'll look at that later. And then we have the original county courthouse with a nice dome and pediment on it. And remember, these were all the original ones. We're looking at the bird's eye view. This is supposedly from 1868. We have the Des Moines River that flows north to south, and its link-up point with the Raccoon, which was what the whole point of building Fort Des Moines was. And we have these four bridges, and they've always been there. Very interesting, as we're told that the railroad came through Des Moines in 1866 for the first time. Yet, from 1851 until now, they built out this core. There's the Polk County Courthouse, and the current one. And look how well built out this core was. This is only 17 years from the flood. Unbelievable. It kind of reminds me of Atlanta when they essentially built the entire core and main portion of Atlanta in under 20 years. Well, this is Iowa out on what's supposed to be the frontier at the time in 1868, and they'd managed to achieve all of this. Well, let's take a look at where the state capital would be, our building number one in all of our explorations in this very impressive city. And granted, this is just a drawing. It doesn't necessarily prove anything. But here we have the actual block of land where the state capital sits now and today. Very impressive. And there's the temporary state capital. <laughs> and when did they build that? And then we can see these photos. And the one on the left, I wonder if it's modified from the one on the right. We'll take a closer look at that. And it's as though they just had the block of land designated already, as though the state capital was already there. But we know that can't be true, right? I mean, look, it assures us. There's the capital, and there's Capitol Square even though it's just an empty patch of land, even though it hadn't been a city that long and they decided to make it the state capital. So again, many anomalies right here with this original image on the left and then what seems to be an altered image on the right. Well, when we see these early images of Des Moines, we see a very well built out city. And one of my main theories is that Des Moines, or City of the Monks for whatever reason, was one of these enclaves from the fourth era civilization designated to retain knowledge and continue the grand tradition of what that civilization had built. And nowhere is that more obvious in the Iowa State Capitol, built 1871-1886, and I'm calling it Midwest Palace Inception style, not Renaissance Revival. And is this a fourth era region forum building or some other incredible palace? We just don't know. This is one of the most impressive structures I've seen in all my explorations on the land. The only state capital that comes close to comparing to this is the one in Connecticut. And here you can see in this aerial footage what the actual tract of land looks like that the state capital sits on. And there on the left you can see the Soldiers and Sailors Monument, a beautiful column that's right next to the state capital. We've looked at that and what an anomaly it is, especially with its lovely statue depiction of Iowa, which seemed a little bit inappropriate for the time, but I guess they accepted it. And strangely enough, they didn't dedicate it until many decades later. Now here's this image of what Des Moines, Iowa looked like in 1857 on Capitol Moving Day when they decided to leave that dump that they had in Iowa City. I'm joking, of course. It looks like a very fine capital, and by the way, it's still standing to this day. We will be exploring it when we get to Iowa City. But it's interesting that we have this city that this teacher described as very unfortunate. And here's this early construction photo we have of the state capitol in Iowa, missing the dome, 1871 to 1886. And this is a very strange looking image. It has many problems if you just look at it and analyze it on your own. Now, I'm not going to tell you what those problems are because you've got eyes. You can see it quite well for yourself. And who knows what the reality is with these photos. But then I found this other photo that shows the dome complete. 
Supposedly, it's supposed to be later than the image we just looked at, but was it really? Or is there something else going on? Is there some sort of image manipulation going on, or is it just as we see it? It's very problematic, especially when we look at accounts for why the good people of Iowa decided to relocate their state capital to a city that hadn't been in existence that long, that had recently been flooded. And here you can see the contrast with some of the furniture here in the governor's office in what I believe is an early 20th century photo. Compare and contrast that with the woodwork above the doorways, and then the beautiful ornamentation. We're in the Iowa State Capitol right now. And then, looking at some of the other images, we have looked at this strange mosaic before, and this is very strange because the mosaic supposedly shows the state capitol with some subsidiary buildings, although we're told it's the older state capitol. <laughs> and then there's some odd smokestacks in the back of it. But please go back and watch my original exploration on the Iowa State Capitol, and I'll add the link in the description. What I didn't really get to, though, because it was shut down at the time, was the impressive library in the Iowa State Capitol. And here we see many of the beautiful decorations within this library, and... Why do you need to go to this extent to have such a well-decorated and yet well-protected library? And yes, this is a very well-protected building. It's on top of the hill, and it's also very well-built. And yet you can see other contrasts with the stairway with the beautiful marble and some interesting icons depicted in it. Not exactly what we'd expect for a state capital in a state known for its corn. We also have some unbelievable beauty with some of the forum and assembly halls for the state legislature. And then we also have an interesting consideration with the Iowa Supreme Court we'll look at later. Back to the library. So we can see it's multiple levels and there's many different access points to it. And it's as though, once again, no little bit of detail has been spared. You have very well beautiful decorated pillars with gold at the top. You have decorated banisters and handrails, and all the room for all the books you can possibly imagine. This almost gives you the feeling that you're looking in one of those very impressive monastic libraries over in Europe. And I'm not beginning to wonder if that's exactly what we had going on with Des Moines, because Des Moines means of the monks, and it was supposed to be River Des Moines, and that's why they built Des Moines here, or at least the fort. And oddly enough, the guy who built it wanted to name it Fort Raccoon, but the War Department overruled him. He said, you're going to name it Des Moines. Wonder what kind of works we have of novels and books and recordings and real information. There's also an account that we looked at of a vast underground beneath the Iowa State Capitol. So who knows what works we still have access to in this library. And there's probably a reason why access to it is limited, and oftentimes we can't get full access to it and, of course, the works of wonder that are in there. Well, let's go on to the Polk County Courthouse. Now, I call this BABS style, City Beautiful, built 1906, and was this a local forum building? Uh, okay, BA is Beaux Arts, but you know how I feel about Beaux Arts. I just consider it a BS style. We did explore this building in Midwest Palaces when we were looking at all the beautiful courthouses across Iowa, and this is one of the most beautiful. This is the old courthouse and post office, built 1871 and demolished in 1968. It's interesting, though, that when we consider these many buildings that they demolished in the 1960s, why did they have this sudden urban renewal that would hit Des Moines? It never really made a lot of sense. I also failed to mention that in the Iowa State Capitol, they built it right after the Civil War, and then they managed to complete it during the Panic of the 1870s, the worst depression until the Great Depression. The inside of the Polk County Courthouse is very beautiful and ornately decorated as well. Now, this is not very far from the Iowa State Capitol. Indeed, it's just right down the same road across the river from it. Look at some of these decorations. What exactly does this mean? Let me know what you think this figure means in the comments based on some of the other explorations that we've done. This is very impressive and very unique. And it's not something we'd expect to see the good people of Iowa throwing up from 1900 to 1906. And the courthouse has its own little version of a very well-decorated and beautiful dome. Certainly not the kind of decorations and efforts that we see put forth with our modern construction techniques of the 21st century, but we have the usual array of reasons why we don't do it. It's too expensive, we have safety standards, we don't have artisans and craftsmen running all over the country. You can also see in this main area in the courthouse the beautiful skylighting. And again, the same decorated handrail. It's an impressive structure that just doesn't seem to add up to what we'd expect to see in Des Moines. And this is one of the other examples, along with the Iowa State Capitol, that you simply can't explain easily away. What, the city of Des Moines, the state of Iowa had all this money after the Civil War, and this is what the official account tells us, that they got a lot of money back, because another interesting tidbit about Iowa, 10% of its entire population contributed to fighting in the Civil War. 
which is quite impressive. No, not 10% of the male population, 10% of the entire population. And who knows what exactly was going on in the Civil War. But we look in the other interiors of this Polk County Courthouse and we can see the arched beauty. And we can see that every ceiling, every wall, and we have the pillars in the wall once again, no attention to detail has been spared. City beautiful, oh of course, and then we've got more columns, and these are complete, looks like one piece columns that are on the inside of the building. And you'll very rarely see any sort of construction photo showing any column establishment, let alone a column being erected inside a building. Once in a blue moon you'll get one on the outside of the building, such as the Civil Courts building in St. Louis. Well, this is the criminal courts in Des Moines, and this is kind of what we'd expect to see. A more modern and, <laughs> I'm not going to say depressing, but perhaps we'll just say not as inspiring as a current building. And I suppose it's appropriate this would be the criminal courts building in Des Moines, Iowa. I don't know, it just gives me a dark feeling just looking at it. I'm not sure why. Well, let's take a look at the Des Moines City Hall, built in 1910, and again, part of the Beaux Arts slash BS style, and it was part of the City Beautiful movement. If you don't recall, the City Beautiful movement was supposedly something that swept all the American cities after the World's Fair in Chicago in the 1890s, and this was their response to it. And apparently, the city of Des Moines was just flush with cash in the early 20th century, much like the entire United States was for reasons unknown. I mean, if things are going so well economically, then why did they need to establish a Federal Reserve, and why did they keep having all these so-called economic panics? But I digress, that's always a conflicting account. Another impressive building where they've managed to integrate the columns in the wall, which is always a unique construction style. And here you can see the City Hall with the Iowa State Capitol behind it. This is on the east side of the Des Moines River. Very impressive structures, both of them. And why do I get the feeling that uh, they were built around the same time originally? Although, who knows for sure. I mean, if we go off the official history, they didn't need a city beautiful movement to build the Iowa State Capitol, and that's one of the most beautiful buildings in the land. One of the lamentable aspects, though, with the Des Moines City Hall is that it was renovated and changed quite a bit. Now, I believe this photo is from before that change occurred, so we'll never understand the true interior beauty of this building. Because as always, they're renovating these buildings and changing them from their original beauty that we had when they were established and built. But you can still see there are some remaining details within the city hall that are quite beautiful and impressive. And we can see some of the decorations above these windows, and even the windows themselves. And to say nothing of the ceiling. I even appreciate the fixtures that all these lights are hanging from. Why don't we do this in our city halls today? I mean... Obviously, we need to make sure that our bureaucrats are focused on their jobs, and we certainly don't want them to be distracted by beautiful ceilings, beautiful windows, and gorgeous vistas that they see when they go into these unique and impressive buildings. And yes, the adjective comes up a lot that you say it's beautiful, but what else can you say? Well, let's compare the Iowa Judicial Branch building. This is postmodern. It's definitely fifth era. It was built in 2003. I actually was present in Des Moines and saw them lift the dome with the mighty sky cranes that they had on top of this building. And I highlight this building for a reason because this is what they'll try to tell us we do in the 21st century. But as always, when you look inside the building, you can tell there's some glaring inconsistencies and there's really no comparison when we look at the three previous buildings that we did and try to compare it to this Iowa Judicial Courts building. It's where the Iowa Supreme Court meets now. They got kicked out of the Iowa State Capitol, or I shouldn't say that, they were relocated here. And looking on the interior, we can see all the wonderful aspects of 21st century architecture. Just feels like it's very cheap and commercial, and they're simply trying to replicate what we could do in the past, supposedly. But of course, we'll be told that's the reason. They couldn't build a beautiful building like the Iowa State Capitol for this building because of safety standards. They didn't have the artisans and craftsmen. They had all... So what they really needed to do was build this very postmodern and monochromatic and monotoned building that on the inside you could see that anybody who's a justice in Iowa would be very depressed walking through. I don't know, it kind of depresses me just looking at it. Why is it we went from the incredible structures of the past to this? Well, we'll be told the usual given reasons. And here you can see in the actual chamber itself for a hearing or proceedings, uh, the ceiling and then the attempts at columns. I mean, they're trying, I'll give them that. And perhaps if we could try to replicate the past, more of our cities would have a welcoming feeling. But to me, this is just evidence that we can achieve what we did in the past. For example, here was where the Iowa Supreme Court met in the Iowa Courthouse before they were relocated. 
And just looking at this black and white photo, you can see that there's absolutely no comparison with this room in the Iowa State Capitol and what we just looked at in their new judicial court building. Okay, it's kind of bringing me down a little bit, so we're going to move on. Let's go to Terrace Hill, the governor's residence in Iowa, built 1866 to 1869 in the so-called Second Empire style. Now, we have another one of these stories that the first millionaire in Des Moines, obviously it didn't take him long to become a millionaire because the city wasn't even around that long, had arranged to have this house built. And he just didn't have it have it built by anybody. He, of course, brought in a genius architect from Chicago, someone who was very well involved in Chicago's World's Fair. In fact, it was the same architect who erected the, or should I say design, but, you know, some people say architects do everything. They design, they build, and then they plan the logistics so they can put up the building. It was the same architect who did the Illinois building who did Terrace Hill. And this has been the governor's residence in Iowa since Governor Day. I believe that was the late 70s, early 1980s. And every governor has resided in here because you couldn't possibly do better than this for a residence. And it's a lovely and incredible old world building that's very stunning inside and out. And here's the Illinois building, and you've probably seen this before from the Chicago World's Fair. And of course it has this uh, very interesting and narrow dome, which kind of reminds me of the Connecticut State Capitol, which is the only state capitol, in my opinion, that compares with the Iowa State Capitol, although it's not five domed. This one's one domed, and it looks like two or four bells. And then also designed this building in Chicago that kind of reminds me of the Smithsonian Castle. I'm sure that's just yet another coincidence. But very impressive, along with the tower and the subsidiary towers, and then there's subsidiary towers on the main tower, so just can't get enough towers on that. Back to Terrace Hill, it has a nice little pool by it, and it looks like there was an older structure in and around it, so what exactly is that all about? And how old is this pool? For some reason, when we look at Terrace Hill, even though they tell us it's Second Empire style, we get the feeling that we're actually back in Rome. And maybe we're going to see Licinius Crassus come over the hill and walk and dive in the pool. Here's an older photo from it. And you can see how it used to be decorated. Now, there's apparently been a lot of back and forth about the actual use of the pool. I mean, why wouldn't the governor of Iowa want to go in there and take a dive at the end of every day? I know I would. Imagine if it was Arnold Schwarzenegger. No, I don't like Iowa. I only go to the magical land of California. I stay away from Conland. So you look at the interior and you can see that there's some unique intricacies on the inside of this wondrous edifice and again some fine geometry in both the walls and the ceiling and remember this is just built as a residence and of course the explanation given is that it was built for the city's first millionaire and he brought the architect in from chicago so anything's possible don't let logistical limitations get in the way of building your dream home and it begs the question why exactly would someone who was so wealthy and so well off in the 19th century want to go out to the frontier where there's a lot of hardships because there was more opportunities because it was cheaper it just doesn't make any sense, and yet it's a story we see repeated all the time. Look at this impressive window on the stairway and banister. And then here again, you can see the detailing in the walls and the ceiling, and painting and decorations, and even look at the fine detail on the pillars in the archway here. And this is just supposed to be a residence? This is just supposed to be somebody's house. <sighs> I mean, really, why would you come out to Iowa? You could have just stayed in Chicago, and this would have been a lot easier. We've seen great mansions in Chicago, Nope, I'm going out to Des Moines to make my fortune. The city flooded just a few years ago. And it should be noted that Des Moines has experienced many floods since then. Uh, most recently, probably the worst one was in 1993. And then there was another one in the 2000s. So, overruns the Sailorville uh, Reservoir, which is just north of the city. Look at some of the impressive banisters and just the layout of this unique house. Second Empire style? I mean, nothing on the inside looks remotely Empire style to me, but of course the actual adjudication of what the styles are is left to the expert architects who are experts in everything. They just don't build like this for a variety of reasons now. And we'll be told it's because the will of the people does not indicate that they want any kind of structures like this built. Well, the governor of Iowa seems to have themselves a really nice residence, whether it's Kim Reynolds, Terry Brandstand, or any of the other names that have filled this office since Robert Day. And here we have the State Historical Building. And isn't this very intriguing? And this is an older photo that shows us that this building's been with us for a while. And this seems to be the building that they were trying to, how should we say, emulate when they built the building for the Iowa Supreme Court. And yet there's some subtle differences that we can see, such as the pediments above the window. And isn't that an interesting eagle up there? Where have we seen that before? 
Is it an eagle or is it something else? Let me know in the comments. And now we see East High School. We're going to look at a couple different high schools because in Iowa we have these high schools where it seems as though they have a very particular design to them. Where they have a pediment and then four columns. And that seems to be the go-to design for many different high schools. And the question I'm going to ask is why? Why do you need to have a pediment and columns for many different high schools? This is the Grotto of the Redemption, and this is the largest grotto in the world. Now, this isn't located in Des Moines. This is in an isolated area in Iowa, but I just thought I would show this as a little bit of a break from the exploration to let you know that there are other anomalies in Iowa. We've got the largest grotto in the world, originally the largest dam, and also the largest viaduct on a two-way railway in the early 20th century. All that on top of the most impressive and only five-dome state capital in the United States. All in Iowa, an agrarian state. An agrarian state whose population for the longest time was only around 2 million. And of course, looking at the population growth of Iowa in the 19th century is, of course, problematic. We'll be told, oh, it was all immigration and there was no problem. Very interesting, though, when you look at these older photos of the Iowa State Capitol, and you can see some of the residences that were apparently within proximity of it. Well, most of those residences have been demolished since then, in conjunction with the downtown of Des Moines, Iowa. And here's the picture of the downtown around the courthouse that we're told was built in 1906, although who knows the truth behind the courthouse. There's some interesting aspects to this image. And what exactly was present in Des Moines? Well, we constantly have clues and indications that there was a lot more present in the past than there is in the present. And that's from several of the images we have. This is the original photo of Lincoln High School, undoubtedly the first public school if we compare and contrast the bird's eye view from 1868 in Des Moines. Now remember, a bird's eye view doesn't necessarily prove anything because it's merely a drawing at the time, a rendering, but it does give us an idea that they already had this city planned out. And remember, it was only 17 years after the flood when they essentially restarted or reset the city again. Here's the current Abraham Lincoln High School, and very impressive structure in and of itself. Again, we see pediments and decorations above the window. We see some very interesting little tower structures. And what exactly is that symbol in that circle all about? Let me know in the comments. Now, we're going to go back and do an exploration just considering a lot of the symbolism, not to be confused with symbology, that we see across the land with many of these great structures. Here's a more modern picture of the Abraham Lincoln High School in Des Moines. And you can see that it's holding up very nicely. You can see, oh, we've also had those symbols that we tend to see around the orb structures. And then we've got some spheres up top and then that strange symbol in the circle again. Here's some older imagery from Des Moines that we're supposedly looking at that's either from the late 19th, early 20th century. And these bricks look like they've been there for quite some time. And I always find the brick walkways and streets and sidewalks and everything else very interesting because it gives the impression that there was a lot more infrastructure present in the city. But then you look at this other image and it looks like the road is covered with complete mud as we look down the way here at the state capitol. This is where we tend to see these conflicting and contrasting accounts. We have the official written accounts of what was going on, but the images don't always seem to match up to them. What's your explanation for this? Well, here we go to Old Main and Drake University. This is the main administration building. We're told this was built in the 1880s. And why is it they always call these buildings Old Main? Well, it was the Old Main Administration Building. It was just a term that everybody used in the 19th century. And you go to any and every university, and that's what it's known for. Drake University is uh, rather interesting with the four major universities uh, in Iowa and the fact that it's in Des Moines. And you look at the Old Main and you can see that there's many unique aspects to its architecture, at least something that we'd not expect to see in some colleges, and yet we have seen it in many colleges with the Old Main Building. It's also impressive that their original Old Main Building standing because we know that's not the case with many other universities. Very unique though with some of the layout, including the main entryway, and looking at the complex precision and arrangement of the blocks and the building bricks, if that's indeed what it is. I need to get on site and take a look at this. Although, I will admit, Drake University has not exactly ever crossed my list of visiting, and you all well know that I've been in Des Moines many times for on-site explorations. So I guess I'm just going to have to add Drake University to the list, because despite my best efforts, I found some challenges finding some interior photos of this old main building. And I'm wondering exactly how it's been altered over the years. And so now you can probably guess I obviously never taught at Drake University. 
Still, there's some other buildings and impressive aspects to it, and we are going to be doing an exploration where we look at some of the impressive universities, not just in the United States, but other universities across the land, because there never seem to be any shortage of, how should we say, very unique and impressive buildings wherever we go, whether we're in the United States or Germany, the United Kingdom, or even in Iraq. Going back to these high schools, you can see that there's a pediment here and the four column design. Now, could these buildings have had a different function originally? Because this seems to be a primary go-to design type that we would consider neoclassical, or as they say, depending on the building, Renaissance Revival. So this high school is located in Waterloo, which is a city that's about a two-hour drive from Des Moines, and I only highlight this to show that this particular style of high school just seems to have persevered across the land. And again, I'm wondering if this was some other original type of function for these buildings. Were these some sort of forums? And we have to wonder, what's the origin of the term forum? Because there's too many examples of these types of high schools with this advanced construction. Some not only have the columns out in front under the pediment on the main entryway, but they also have the columns that are integrated into the walls. So, very intriguing that there are so many examples of these so-called high schools that have these architectural intricacies in them. Why wouldn't they have built more modest high schools at the time? This is the remnants of Fort Madison, and this is another on-site exploration I'm going to be doing. Now, this is over in the Mississippi area of Iowa. And the reason I'm highlighting some of the other anomalies in Iowa as part of the Des Moines exploration is there's just something very unique about this overall state and this portion of the land, even though we're told that it's flyover country. We shouldn't pay any attention to it. There's nothing unique here about Abraham Lincoln School. There's nothing really to see about it. Yes, they have some very impressive architectural detailings, but you need that to have an effective high school. Iowa took their education seriously, and you could only seriously educate students if you had the very finest buildings to do so in. Of course, they don't seem to have retained that to now, but things have changed. Such as Highland Park College. Here we have our postcard of Highland Park College, and this compound is very intriguing because we think of all the other university or colleges that we see across the land and yet we have to ask ourselves is this representing something else because if we go back to the concept that something about Des Moines or the original city from the fourth era made it special then perhaps there was something that was intentionally preserved here because what we see when we look at the older images of Des Moines whether it's the city core the colleges the municipal buildings or even the state capital we get the impression that for whatever reason this area was spared the effects of the reset because it seems to have been completely intact now there is a little bit of a tragedy that accompanies it because once the so-called city beautiful movement ended in the 20th century when we got to the mid 20th century des moines was unfortunately afflicted by that urban renewal movement of course they have their usual explanations in the economics at the time and here in this veterans hospital, once again, we see the same layout that we saw in the high schools with the pediment and the four columns all over Iowa. So not just high schools. And this is what a lot of people expect to see when they think of Iowa. Open farmland, some trees, some hills, although a lot more flat than this, but there are actually a lot of hilly areas in Iowa. And then you can look in some of the older postcards and you can see that there were many more buildings when you look at the old city core of Des Moines. And we're going to look at two images in a second that were very difficult to come by. And we're going to look at the Victoria Hotel now, built in 1899, I say three question marks because you know you can always question it, and destroyed, not demolished, in 1962. How could they destroy a building like this? A very incredible and remarkable hotel. And we don't really have much in terms of records for what the interior of it looked like. But why would anybody want to get rid of something like this? All we really have is this brochure and some posters that give us some clue in terms of what the interior looked like. The Victoria Motel in Des Moines. And this is one of the famous railway hotels. And they even tell us that it's an exclusively European plan. But we get some hint of what the interior was like, although this is really just more of a drawing, so does this really prove anything? No, but it does give us some hints. Some people might argue, well, it's a drawing that's based on a photograph. I'm not really sure. Maybe it's a photograph, maybe it's a drawing. That's always the hard thing to tell. But what kind of opulence and decorative detail did you have in this once great impressive hotel that graced the skyline of Des Moines? And there were many edifices that graced the city core of Des Moines. And if you ask any resident of Des Moines who's been around and understands the history of the city, they'll confirm, even the mainstream, that the city core was devastated. Now, I couldn't verify if this was the actual entryway or lobby of the Victoria Hotel, but we see a radiator there, and it may be. 
Yes, this is the kind of hotel and the kind of apartment building that you'll have in Des Moines. For the low, low price of $2,100 a month, one of these nice little individual units could be yours. Or for the low, low price of $450,000, this nice postmodern home can be yours. Just so I compare and contrast that. Ah, there we go, the Victoria Hotel. So you can see there's really no comparison of what we try to say is modern from what we used to have in the past. It's a clear and decisive degradation in capability. Now, let's take a look at the Des Moines aerials from 1957. This is where we see perhaps one of the greatest tragedies of Des Moines. Many of these wondrous buildings, and these were not brutalist architecture buildings, when you look a little bit more closer, you can see that a lot of these were old world buildings. Many of these were unfortunately torn down in the 1960s to include the aforementioned Victoria Hotel. And when you look a little closer, you get an idea of the tragedy. Even mainstream defenders of the account will admit that the core of Des Moines was decimated. That's the terminology that they use. And many of these very impressive structures were torn down. And in fact, when you go to the core of Des Moines now, around the Polk County Courthouse, you'll notice that it seems a little barren. Especially when you compare and contrast these aerial photos from the 1950s, even to the opening imagery that we had when we started. Here's another one. And when you look at some of these buildings, such as this one here, look at this dome. And some of the impressive designs that went into this building. And I'm always up to the question in terms of what the actual construction material was from the Iowa State Capitol to all these buildings. Were these some sort of advanced geopolymer, some sort of concrete that matched Roman concrete, or even some material that we do not fully understand? Indeed, I remember going to the Polk County Courthouse in the Midwest Palaces exploration and pondering exactly what that was made out of because there's something about that material, including the material of the Iowa State Capitol, that does not seem like a material that we would ever produce today or be capable of producing back in the early 20th century. Now from the 1950s, let's go back to 1906 and look at this panorama of Des Moines. Look at that impressive building there to the left. This is the very start of the 20th century. And when you look at this panorama and we're looking east, you can see there were many more buildings in the early 20th century. There is the state capitol, building number one, the great palace of the Iowa State Capitol, and yet all these other impressive buildings in Des Moines. This picture right here, this panorama, really shows how much was lost over the years. And the aerial photos from the 1950s shows how much was lost. I think that's some of the greatest evidence that we have of what remained of the fourth era in Des Moines, Iowa. So thank you for joining me. Welcome to the Restitutor Orbis channel and today we'll be exploring Midwest Palaces, Old World Builders of County Courthouses. I recall on our recent live stream we discussed the incredible county courthouses, especially of the Iowa area. And during my on the ground explorations, I had the pleasure of traveling through Iowa where I saw this very beautiful Polk County Courthouse. Now this is in Des Moines where it shouldn't be too surprising to see a beautiful edifice. And looking at the old bird's eye view of Des Moines, Iowa from 1868, We'll see that we have many plans for wonderful buildings, and they did have the county courthouse at the time, supposedly, depicted and plotted on the map. Although they didn't have the state capital, they had this vast plot of land that was designated to be the state capital land. So make of it what you will. Here we have the Des Moines River and the many beautiful bridges that were already present in Des Moines, Iowa in 1868. Very impressive, I have to say. You can look at the imagery for yourself today and see what they have there now and how similar and how dissimilar it actually is. But when you follow Court Avenue in Des Moines running to the west, it runs right into the courthouse. And this is how it was depicted in 1868. Very impressive building. We see a pediment and a beautiful tower with a little dome on it. So just to give you the layout of how the first county courthouse that we're looking at appears, it's quite incredible. 
And when we think about courthouses, this is probably what our typical expectation may be. A rather modest building, perhaps, with some sort of little tower or small dome on it. And even this one has a pediment, although we'll think that this is the rudimentary building that the construction capabilities of the 19th century would support. Of course, with the modernization and urban rule, we see courthouses like this, with our wonderful, beautiful, brutalist architecture. Basically a box and... That's where you'll have the local municipal county functions take place. Go in there for your hearings, go in there for your tax evasion court cases, and of course this beautiful courthouse in Marion County, Iowa. So the reason I show you this is just to give you the idea that not every single courthouse from the past has survived, and we do have the wondrous beauties of our modern architecture. And of course my favorite, Rock County in Wisconsin. And you know, not to pick on Janesville, because Janesville is a very pretty town that has some other old world buildings in it that happen to surround this courthouse. Unfortunately, the old courthouse from Rock County in Janesville, Wisconsin did not survive. This is what we have today. And now to the Polk County Courthouse, built in 1906. Consider that this is Des Moines, Iowa, and take a look at this very beautiful building. So we already have the Iowa State Capitol that was constructed a good 30 years before this, although we're told that they still worked on it. And yet, just down the road from it, barely a mile away, you have this beautiful courthouse in Des Moines, Iowa, the courthouse representing Polk County. And we see that they put all the beautiful details in it with the incredible pediments, all the window decorations, and of course the beautiful tower with the beautiful cupola on top of it. And let's not forget the wonderful clock that has the Roman numerals on it. Except, of course, for the four, something I always notice on the older clocks where they don't have the IV, but the four ones in Roman numerals all next to each other. Look at the gorgeous, beautiful detail on this incredible building. All this for a courthouse in 1906, and I'm going off of the mainstream account. But when you look at how well carved these stones are, and then of course as if they didn't have enough to do, they put on these beautiful and yet interesting faces above these windows. Is that supposed to represent insane evil, crazy evil, happy time justice? I'm not sure. But when you look at this courthouse, it is a very large edifice, and looking at it directly, I don't know. You know, you have the wreaths there, and it almost looks as though some sort of decorative motif was removed. You also see the beautiful eagles there standing guard around the cupola, and of course the many columns that we always see in these buildings. I'd really love to see how they actually did this, and of course we'll never see how the foundation was established. And look at the beautiful pediments here, and then some of the detail in the architecture. Of course we always have these little lion heads that seem to crop up in many of these buildings that we look at. I'd really like to know what the official explanation is for the obsession with lions in the United States in the late 19th, early 20th century, because they definitely come up a lot. And then looking up here, we have the same style of columns being lifted up onto the upper floors, much as we see in the Iowa State Capitol. Of course, it's not too absurd this time, because they already showed they had the capability, so why couldn't they do it in the early 20th century? That's fine, but when we consider how much did this building actually cost, and you can look it up, and you know if you want to believe cost and the objective value of money, be my guest. Although I think recent events have shown us that the value of money is not quite as objective as we like to think. And it certainly wasn't quite objective in the early 20th century. But looking at the beautiful detail here in these pediments, and just some of the fine artistic detail, as though they had all the time in the world, and all for a county courthouse, and what actually happens in county courthouses. Well, we think of the regular bureaucratic functions of the county or parish, if you're in Louisiana, which is their analog to a county in the wonderful state of Louisiana. But here we see these fine blocks. And getting up close, I was thinking about what the nature of their composition was. We're told that modern construction techniques, we don't have the same Roman concrete that the Romans built with. That's obviously granite there. And so I'm wondering about the composition of this material. And look at this, you even have a little lion's head here on this little side piece to the entryway. You might call it a very elaborate banister, or you might just call it a foundation piece, or maybe it's just on there for art. Yet I'm very impressed by all the detail that they put in shaping each of these stones, or each of these building blocks. And what's the exact composition of the material? We'll always be told that it's some sort of limestone, sandstone. But I'm speculating if it's some other sort of concrete or some other construction material that we can't properly identify, and yet the historical account will tell us that they know what it is. Of course they will. 
The interior of this building is no less incredible, and while I couldn't get inside of it since I did the exploration on Sunday, you can see some photos, and I do recall exploring this with Old World Exploration, and it was very breathtaking. And keep in mind, this is after I had just been in the Iowa State Capitol. And yet, here in this courthouse, not a mile away, they had done many of the same things with the beautiful architecture, and of course, the skylight, and the wonderful artistic appeal. This doesn't seem like a building that you'd be going into for conducting your bureaucratic county business or what have you. And of course, you have no shortage of columns on the inside of this, much like the Iowa State Capitol. So what exactly is going on and why is this so interesting for the state of Iowa? Well, the state of Iowa really didn't have any natural form of wealth. And look here at this uh, beautiful dome structure in the ceiling. The state of Iowa didn't have natural wealth. It was an agrarian state, especially in the 19th century. So where exactly did this come about? And in the early exploration, when I did uh, Miracles in the Frontier, or Miracles in the Midwest Rural Frontier, you're still trying to explain why there was no accounting of how they mined and processed this Anamosa limestone and then got it all over the country. Because we're told that the Anamosa limestone, which comes from Anamosa, Iowa, was used in the construction of such buildings as the Disney Opera House in Los Angeles. Well, how exactly did they transport it out there? And the answer will be, well, they threw it on train. Okay, that's fine. They couldn't find any construction materials a little closer to Los Angeles. Downtown Des Moines is always interesting, though, because you see other incredible buildings. And this is right next to the courthouse. And you see some of the details of the columns at the base. And when you go up towards the roof, and again, you see these incredible pillars towards the top. And this is something else I would have enjoyed seeing constructed. And no, I'm not talking about photos. Oh, yes, let's not forget about the pediments above the windows. But I'm talking about live footage. Because I can actually remember driving by the construction site of the 801 Grand Building in Des Moines. And that was back in the late 1980s. And you could really see the building go up. And of course, the 801 Grand Building doesn't compare to these buildings. And it certainly doesn't compare to the Iowa State Capitol. So a very beautiful architecture that still resides in Des Moines. And it's not just the courthouse. Well, let's go on to another courthouse built in 1903, the Appanoose County Courthouse in Centerville, Iowa. Now, why is this courthouse more interesting or as interesting as the Polk County Courthouse? Well, we can explain the Polk County Courthouse. It was in Des Moines, its largest city in Iowa at the time. And yet here we're down in Centerville, Iowa, which is very isolated. And yet they managed to fund and build a very beautiful courthouse. Now, most of these counties that we're looking at, their population never exceeded 16,000. Some, it's even less. So I find it quite substantial that they managed to build a beautiful courthouse like this. And you see different pictures of these courthouses in various states of repair. Here you can see the windows boarded up, and it almost looks like some of the windows are broken. And it looks like some of the stone's older, as though it's been through some very difficult natural processes over the years. Whether you want to say it's weather, or you know, it's all the coal-burning factories that they had in the middle of uh, Centerville in this county. Which, by the way, is completely surrounded by cornfields. So, I'm not accepting that explanation for this particular beautiful building. But this is an example of your isolated rural courthouse that they somehow managed to fund and build across Iowa. And most of the courthouses were built between 1880 and 1910. It's quite an extraordinary achievement. And I think it stands out because you see these details, even in this isolated town, which is in the middle of many farm fields in Iowa, that they managed to pull this off. And what's it built out of? Is it made out of limestone? Is it made out of sandstone? Or is it made out of some other incredible concrete mixture that we don't fully identify, or we just call Roman concrete? Well, now we go to the Marshall County Courthouse in Marshalltown, Iowa, built in 1886. This one is very interesting because this courthouse took a direct hit from a tornado a very large and powerful tornado back in 2018. And I was able to get on the ground and get some footage of this beautiful courthouse, and this is what it looks like today. Now, they've just completed renovations on it where they replace the top dome and the cupola. And there's also footage of them replacing that cupola back in the 1970s. Well, I'm going to attach the link. There's some very dramatic footage of the tornado actually hitting this courthouse, and the only thing that got torn down from the courthouse was the cupola. The dome survived it pretty well. So bottom line up front, basically the main structure of the courthouse itself is tornado proof. The only thing that got pulled away was the cupola. Now, if it was the original cupola, could it have been pulled away by the tornado? Possibly. But I guess we'll never know the real durability of the old world construction capabilities on the top of the cupola. But we certainly know it for the rest of the building. And I will attach that link in the description of the video so you can look at the dramatic footage of this courthouse being hit by a tornado and how it stood up to it. 
But again, you see the same construction details. You have pillars that are lifted up multiple floors. You have the same incredible base stone. And again, I think it's important to ask the questions, what is this base stone? In Marshalltown, Iowa, which is a town of about 27,000, you also see other beautiful buildings, such as this. And we have our usual symbols that we know, and we have the year that's put on the building, 1909. And again, you see very beautiful pillars that are lifted up, multiple floors in the air. A nice little old world house that's next to it, and apparently that's uh, Edward Jones. Now... But this is just the downtown area of Marshalltown, and I find the layout very interesting how it supports the fact that the courthouse is right here. And you know that this is the original courthouse. Was it really actually built in 1886? Well, that's what they'll tell us, and that's even what's on the side of the courthouse. And you can see who's responsible, supposedly, for building this very beautiful courthouse. And look at these very beautiful base stones here. Now, what is this? Is this sandstone? Is this limestone? Is this some other material that we're not really sure? And people will say, yes, it's an architectural process. That's why the base stones look like this. And we've come to accept these explanations. However, when you look at the other stones, you see that it's very similar to the Polk County Courthouse that we just looked at. So a very beautiful courthouse for Marshalltown, Iowa, a town that's never exceeded 27,000. It should also be noted that the Iowa Veterans Home is located in Marshalltown, which is another somewhat isolated location, although to be fair, you could say that pretty much any location in Iowa outside of the main cities of Des Moines, Cedar Rapids, Waterloo, is relatively isolated. Oh, and I don't want to forget the Quad Cities. I also find this interesting. They have the statue of Henry Anson, the supposed founder of Marshalltown, and you can read his bio there. And it's very intriguing, the, the story that they talk about, how this person who was just a great leader and happened to bring about this town. There's some interior photos of the Marshalltown County Courthouse, or the Marshall County Courthouse, and of course you see no shortage of columns on the inside too. Again, I would love to see construction photos of how they managed to lay this out. It's incredibly beautiful on the inside. And of course, if you're just walking through this every day and will be conditioned to just bypass this, there's nothing extraordinary about these columns or the construction of this county courthouse. This is just where county business occurs and I walk through it every day without paying any attention to it. And if you try to tell me otherwise, I'm going to get upset at you. So this is a photo from the 1970s that shows them actually reconstructing the cupola on the top. So it's safe to say that the cupola that existed from 1970 on was with modern construction techniques. But you can see that the rest of the building was the original building, at least if we take photos at face value. This is a photo of the courthouse after it was struck by the tornado, and you can see that the cupola was removed. And if you look at the video link, you'll find that very dramatic footage. And I think the person that shot that from, I believe it was a local quick trip, a gas station, they deserve credit and views for getting that incredible footage. Now they rebuilt the courthouse, and of course it seems they've replaced the top dome. So perhaps when the next tornado comes and hits it, it won't just be the cupola, it'll be the dome as well, but the rest of it will be fine. Yes, I'm giving my confidence and my vote of confidence in the quality of old world construction. I just have a feeling that this new world construction just doesn't have the same strength. Isn't it interesting that we have this very large and powerful crane that's required to lift this beautiful new dome to the top of the Marshall County Courthouse? Well, I'm sure they had those abilities back in the 19th century. And now we go to Grundy County, built in 1891, the Grundy Center, Iowa. Grundy Center, Iowa is even more isolated than Marshalltown. It's north, northeast. And this is another very beautiful courthouse that's in a relatively small town in a county that never exceeded 16,000. The population is the population of the entire county. And when they built this beautiful courthouse, it certainly wasn't anywhere close to that. Although, the other thing you'll see that corresponds with the massive run on building courthouses in Iowa from 1880 to 1910 is the rapid increase in population. And of course, we'll explain that away by saying it was immigration and everybody wanted their opportunity to leave the comforts of living in Europe so they could live in freedom in the United States and manage their own fields, own their own land, and live the American dream. And of course, that included building many beautiful courthouses. I always find it interesting, though, that the courthouses have to include these incredibly beautiful towers. And the beautiful courthouse here in Grundy County, located in the town of Grundy Center, is no exception. And got on the ground in Grundy Center as well. And it's a very pretty little town with some unique aspects to it that I did capture. But beautiful clock tower. And of course, we have the Roman numerals. And yet it looks like the construction material for this courthouse is the same construction material that was the base stones that we just saw in the previous Marshall County Courthouse. But I'm not sure. It could be something completely different. 
what will they tell us? Is it limestone? Is it sandstone? Is it some sort of Rosendale cement or Rossendale cement, excuse me? Looking at the downtown of Grundy Center, though, very beautiful, well-developed downtown. And this is a very modest-sized town. Oh, look at that. One of those protruding towers. <sighs> because it wasn't difficult enough to build these buildings, you need to have a protruding tower. And back to the courthouse, it looks like they put Grundy County on the front of the courthouse. And of course, they gave us the date of 1891, just to be sure that we know that's when they built it. Was it really in 1891? I'm not sure. It looks like they replaced the door right there and added some interesting blocks that are a little bit more modern. That does look to me like that's that good old Portland cement that we certainly love to use. And we know how durable and long lasting it is. Oh, look, some broken windows on the courthouse. I wonder what's going on there. Maybe someone should take some pictures of it, and maybe that's done just to confuse the account. So if I took a picture of this courthouse in 2023, potentially I could tell you that it was built in 2023, or whatever the new timeline will be if we get a new timeline sometime down the road. Not saying we will, I don't know. But here looking at this other angle of this courthouse in Grundy Center for Grundy County, Iowa, you see more examples of these beautiful stones and how these were formed and shaped and built. And I'm not even thinking about or discussing the monetary requirements or the labor requirements that would have been necessary to build this beautiful courthouse. And looking up at the clock tower and some of the towers on this. And of course you see some of the details of the architecture that are very impressive. And once again we lifted some pillars all the way to the top of the clock tower because why not? How are you going to know it's a courthouse unless it has some elaborate construction? Minimal interior photos, but this is a very old interior photo of the courtroom in Grundy County for Grundy Center and very impressive. You see some of the details there with the interior courtroom along with what looks to be a very elaborate arch. I took a look at some of the buildings in Grundy Center and no less impressive, especially when you always look at the second floor because it looks like the signs of the old world or older civilization and construction endures on the second floor. Well, let's go to Tama County. This one was built in 1866. Tama County is south, southeast of Grundy Center, and it's directly east of Marshall County. Tama County has the oldest courthouse that we're looking at, at least if we go off the official count in 1866. And we see they have another one of these beautiful monuments. Most of these courthouses have these beautiful monuments, and it seems to replicate the pattern that was set at the Iowa State Capitol, although we're told that this monument, which of course is a Civil War monument, was constructed long before the Iowa State Capitol, as was this courthouse. And it should be noted that Tama County, the county seat, is actually in the town of Toledo, Iowa, although Toledo and Tama are considered twin cities or twin towns. So very interesting when you look at this account. And again, this is another one of these counties that didn't have that great of a population. It certainly never necessitated a beautiful courthouse like this, especially in 1866 when we're told that the population was about 5,000. But of course, you needed a very beautiful and magnificent courthouse like this. And they still have the, it looks to be the original clock, or they've replaced it in the framework of the original, but we know that's the original stone. Very impressive with the archway of the entry point there to the courthouse. And again, what are those stones made of? Yes, we see bricks, but it's an interesting combination. I was trying to figure out exactly what this platform was and what sort of construction material it was made out of. Was it made out of our more modern concrete or was it something a little older? It was difficult to ascertain, although it did provide a good filming platform to get the entire length of the courthouse because this Tama County courthouse is deceptively large. It doesn't look quite so large when you look at it from the front or main approach from the street, but when you walk, walk alongside of it, you can see that it has a lot more depth to it. So very interesting and a lot of little details, all for the wonders of 1866 in a very isolated Iowa county and a state that hadn't even been a state for 20 years yet. This monument was also very interesting in the Tama County area next to the Tama County Courthouse because it seems they allowed a nice tree to grow next to it and it's as though the tree almost obscures the monument. But you see it's another very impressive column and while not as large as the incredible column, the Soldiers and Sailors Monument that they have in Des Moines at the Iowa State Capitol, this is still pretty impressive, especially for Tama County in the 1860s. I do find it interesting though that it looks like they bolted on this metal with the battles and when it was erected of course it says 1890 but who knows for sure on that and i've never quite seen a monument that's exactly like this yes certainly the column or what have you yet you have these symbols that commemorate the civil war that are bolted on very fascinating i'm not sure what to make of that why don't you tell me what you think of it in the comments 
And then over here we see the Battle of Vicksburg, and then we have all the names that are on these metal plates, and the names are actually engraved on the metal plates. And of course we'll say, well, it was cheaper, it was probably a little easier to do, instead of actually just carving it into, this appeared to be marble, with some other form of concrete on it. But the actual monument itself is holding up very nicely, but you can see that these metal plates, interesting, an Illinois regiment being commemorated in Tama, Iowa. Oh well, maybe all those soldiers were from Iowa. I'm not going to guesstimate on this. Nevertheless, it's a very fascinating monument. You can see the battles, and they went to all the trouble of building it, but then they decided to put the names on metal plates. Not sure what to make of it. So back in Toledo, Iowa, a very pretty little town, and yet it has some unique history that seems to survive in its little downtown as well. We've got some of these older buildings, which, of course, they put the dates on. It amazes me we don't put dates on our buildings today. I wonder why. But in any event, you look at the downtown, you can see some of the construction hallmarks of what we traditionally identify as old world construction. Every single, every single window beautifully decorated and coming all the way back around and looking at the monument and the courthouse itself. Now, this used to be an opera house that they seem to have converted into a theater now. The Whiting, I believe. Interesting that they have some columns in the front of it. I didn't go up to check what they were made of, but it's very interesting overall. So very interesting, and then over here it looks like we have a United Brethren Church. This is an intriguing building for a small town of Toledo. Very, very well built with bricks and a very interesting entryway. And then finally the Toledo Public Library. I mean, while it's a smaller building, it's certainly not modest in its construction techniques, especially for a small town like this. So perhaps Toledo managed to confabulate the funds needed for this incredible building and even having these little pillars out front. And again, wondering on the concrete on this. Washington County, built 1885 to 1887. Now, this is a very interesting courthouse down in southeast Iowa because you see it resembles a bit of an owl when you look at it, especially with looking at the clock tower and the front facade from this particular perspective. Very interesting building and built in 1886, although it said 1885 to 1887, so who knows on the official historical account. And this one has a little bit of everything. It appears to have some of the brick, it has a bit of the columns in it, and yet very intriguing with this uh, owl facade, if you will, because it does really appear like an owl. And I'm trying to remember who called that out in the live stream, but I thought that was a wonderful observation. And it's a very intriguing construction format to use for a courthouse. I also love it when they always do the little columns down there below the arch because that's just something we don't do. And then, of course, you have that uh, multiple arch doorway in there mixed with the brick and the other block, whether that's concrete. I'm willing to bet it's not Portland cement, but you know it might be. Maybe they just took really good care of it. I still question it. And you look at older photos, you can see that this courthouse always looked the same ever since that it was built if we go off of the veracity of the time and date of the photos. Still, it's intriguing to think of all these wonderful buildings, and this is what the original courthouse looked like. We don't have pictures of it, but we got a nice drawing. Now, I'm focused on Iowa because Iowa's a little more isolated. It's known for being an agrarian state, and much as the Iowa State Capitol is an extraordinary achievement, it's not to say that there aren't beautiful courthouses across the land. But we're going to look at some of the beautiful courthouses in Iowa. All these are built before 1930, according to the official account. And to me, it's very intriguing because Iowa has 99 counties that are very spread out across rural agrarian farmland, and yet they managed to achieve this kind of construction beauty in many of these incredible courthouses. And I'll be sure to upload these photos to the Reddit site so you can look at them at your leisure and study them if you're so inclined. But very intriguing that all these small towns and all these isolated rural counties managed to build these very impressive courthouses with all of these different supposed building techniques, at least so we're told. And yet they pulled all this off all at the same time, too, because if you look at the construction dates that we're given, oh, this is Dallas County. This is a very beautiful one, somewhat like the Polk County Courthouse. Yeah, it looks like a castle. And then you contrast it with this one. And you can see that there are incredible building styles that are used. Here's the Boone County Courthouse. So what to make of all this? That's uh, in Dubuque, Iowa. As though they could build anything, do anything, and had the capability to do it in all in a short amount of time. And keep in mind that while they were building all these county courthouses, they were also building the state capitol. They were also building the prison in Anamosa. And let's not forget about the state hospital that we looked at in Independence, Iowa. 
Of course, if you were to ask any questions about, hey, why does my courthouse look like an owl? You'd probably find yourself on the way to the state hospital or the asylum, as they called it, down in Mount Pleasant because it was still operating at that time. If you were very unlucky, you were probably sent to independence. But still, the variety of construction techniques used in these courthouses, and not a single one that we're looking at in these varied locations. Oh, look, there's another monument on that one. Not a single location we're looking at is any slouch. Well, I wanted to go back and stop by the Iowa State Capitol since I was in the area, and it looks like they're doing some renovation on it. Now, why am I calling this out? Because I'm told by local sources that the renovation is something that's on a long-term plan every 10, 20, 30, 40 years. There's even accounts of bricks just randomly falling off of this beautiful state capital from the early 20th century. And yet, looking at the area, you'll see that there's other beautiful buildings that are in the immediate vicinity of the Iowa State Capitol. For example, the State Historical Memorial and Art Building. Nice eagle on top of it. And there's a dome, and as if it didn't have enough. And this is located very close to the Iowa State Capitol. And remember that this vast plot of land, they already had designated in 1868, if we're to go off of the bird's eye view map. Oh, isn't this interesting? The Boy Scouts of America dedicating a <laughs> very unique little Statue of Liberty replica. And you'll see this in front of a couple different courthouses in Iowa, and it looks exactly the same. And the year on that was 1950. So, yes, that's what we could do in 1950. But looking at the courthouse, I'm always pondering if they're actually doing this renovation to give the impression that they're doing the renovation. Because while this has been going on over decades, what are they really doing? And there's certainly nothing that ever seems to be structurally unsound about this beautiful state capitol. So why are they always doing renovations on it? Is this to give us the impression that this old world building is rickety and needs constant attention, otherwise it would fall down tomorrow? Or is this really just to show us that this state capital requires constant attention and not to allow us to gain the impression that these were buildings that were constructed in a vastly superior manner that will endure for all time? And looking at the Soldiers and Sailors Monument here, another beautiful column. And of course, another little monument. Very interesting how we always have these Greek figures all around to commemorate our <laughs> Civil War entanglement, or as they called it on those monuments, War of the States. Looking once again, it always looks like the statues were added as an afterthought, and the reliefs were added as an afterthought. And they'll even tell you that when you look up the construction of this monument. But what's this all mean? This means that there are many questions that we have about these courthouses, and you can certainly find beautiful courthouses across the United States, whether it's in Pennsylvania, Nebraska, California, Oregon, all these areas where you'll find these county courthouses. And they seem to reflect the model that we see here with the beautiful state capitol in Iowa and the beautiful Civil War monument. One of the questions I always had is, why was it the Civil War veterans always got much nicer monuments? That, that's just my opinion. I'm not trying to inflame anything or offend anybody. But we always say that World War II was the greatest generation. And yet, they don't seem to have comparable monuments to what the Civil War veterans got. Although, interesting story about this monument in Iowa. It was supposedly finished uh, before the 20th century even started. But they didn't get around to dedicating it until World War II, when they only had a handful, a literal handful, of Civil War veterans that were left alive to appreciate its dedication. Really, what are they doing with this renovation? And, of course, we see these vast sky cranes that we know we had available in 1870 when they originally built this incredible edifice, or so we're told. It's very beautiful. It's on a hill. Overlooking the skyline of Des Moines, and there we see the 801 Grand Building in the distance, the building that I believe does not compare with the state capitol. Well, thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Welcome to the Restituto Orbis channel and thank you for joining me today. You know how it goes, you're driving along through the vast plains and you come along miracles on the Midwest frontier. Today we're going to be exploring miracles. Much in the same way the Iowa State Capitol just rises on a hill in Des Moines. 
Regardless of what direction you approach Des Moines from, you're going to see the Iowa State Capitol, and it appears to be the tallest building in the city, even though it's not. What is it about Iowa that compels it to have these incredible edifices? The five-dome state capital of Iowa, the only five-dome state capital in the United States. Iowa is a state known for its excellent corn, a great quote from John Levi, and he's absolutely correct. The sweet corn in Iowa is incredible. Yet we're going to be exploring three specific locations that are very far apart. We're also going to be looking into the potential mystery of Anamosa limestone. We'll be starting by looking at the Independence State Hospital, an asylum located in Independence, Iowa, and as you can see, quite isolated in eastern Iowa. What's the mystery behind the Independence State Hospital? Why is there a large asylum in Iowa? We'll next be going to Anamosa to look at the Anamosa State Penitentiary, the first major state penitentiary in Iowa, built in 1870 to the 1890s, and again out of the Anamosa Limestone. And then finally we'll be heading down to southeast Iowa, in the very tail of the state in Keokuk, to look at the town and the incredible Keokuk plant that was constructed there. How is it this agrarian state, known for its excellent corn, managed to pull off these incredible edifices? Well, you can see how isolated Iowa is, stuck in the middle of the United States, and this is what your experience will be when you drive across it. Vast tracts of plains and cornfields. If you're lucky, you'll be in a part of the state where you can see some of the trees. And I don't say that to be derogatory. I'm merely saying that's what you're going to see when you drive through Iowa. Beautiful cornfields, it's all nice and green. And it's the soil in Iowa that gives it the capability of producing the wonderful corn. After lots of driving, eventually you'll come upon a massive grain elevator or a co-op of some sort that you'll see in the distance, an indication that you're coming up onto a small town. And you'll come through a small town like this one, St. Ansgar in northern Iowa. But that's all you'll really see. Lots of cornfields and a few scattered small towns. Certainly not the developed infrastructure that you'd expect when you just suddenly pull off the road in some random location and look around where you see a very well-maintained and mowed grass. And in the distance, you see a very large building, a building that looks out of place for this beautiful rural agrarian setting. What's the story behind this building? We've arrived at Independence State Hospital in Independence, Iowa, another one of the great mental asylums as part of the Kirkbride plan. It was constructed in 1873 and it was urgently needed, so they built it to last, naturally. And it seems as though they've built it out of the finest Anamosa limestone that they could find. Although they don't exactly say that, even though Anamosa is not too far away. So 1873, they were in dire need of another asylum. The first asylum, located in Mount Pleasant, Iowa, was overcrowded. So therefore, they rapidly built this one. And you'll see that it follows the traditional layout of the Kirkbride plan. Very interesting location where you see the large wings off of it, and this is not even the entire compound. How did they manage to pull this off in the 1870s in Iowa? It was such a priority to build this asylum. And here in this rendering, you do get a better idea of the compound. And yet, once again, we see a self-sufficient compound that has everything it needs, its own power, its own water, its own food, as though it could be completely isolated. And it's interesting to note that this asylum, or mental hospital as it's called now, is located well outside the town limits of independence. And yet, older photos, we see Incredible, lavish construction on the interior with columns and beautiful stairways and banisters and of course a very beautiful floor because that's exactly what you need for people who need mental health intervention and people who are being committed to asylums. I guess if you look at those beautiful pillars, it'll help you feel a little more stable. And in all honesty, I can actually see the justification for that. And here you have this beautiful stairway that's managed to endure to this time. Independent, Independent State Hospital is very well maintained, and it's very interesting when we consider the fact that the original state hospital, or the original asylum in Iowa, in Mount Pleasant, was torn down some time ago. And yet we still see the similar hallmarks, a vast compound that on this channel we've theorized was used as some sort of sanctuary from a previous reset. Oh, yes, they also have underground tunnels that connect every single building. Because why not? You know, maybe you need to have another avenue to move patients around and keep them out of the bad weather. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? Yes, it has a fully developed tunnel system that is well maintained, connecting every single building in a subterranean network. So what's really the story behind this independent state hospital? 
Well, when you drive up to it, you're awed by its size and the fact that it takes you a good minute to drive off of the main highway to reach the state hospital. And you see an incredible beauty within the construction itself. Now, the limestone that we're told about, the Anamosa limestone, is located not too far from this location. But still, a crew had to cut all of these blocks, they had to form them perfectly, and then they had to build this. And we're told that they built this, in haste, <laughs> in 1873. And you can see that this facility is massive. Why do you need four floors in the main administration building? Why do you need large pillars, window dressings, pediments, and the whole 10 yards that we see in all these old world buildings? And when you check, you'll find that all of the stone and all these construction materials are hard as they come. And yet they're finely cut and crafted and fit together in a master work of construction and a beautiful achievement. It's very difficult to actually capture the entire length of this compound just because of obstructions from the trees once you're close to it. It's also interesting to me when you consider the fact that the foliage acts to hide a lot of this compound. And it's not just the main building. There are several subsidiary buildings that are all around it that seem to be made of brick. Now you might think that the brick buildings are older, but I suspect that the main compound itself is actually older, as it shows a form of craftsmanship and construction that is far beyond classic brick buildings. But whenever you look around, it's just unbelievable how large this entire compound is. It's not just the main building, it's all the large satellite buildings that you have. And even they seem to be constructed with care, as though they were all built to last. Looking here at the western section of the Independent State Hospital, or the Iowa Asylum, or whatever name you want to call it that it was originally known, you can get an idea for just how extensive the grounds are, and just how extensive the main building is. You can even see the classic base stones that we see. And then you have this connecting building. Very interesting how they managed to craft all of these stones and fit this together, with a brick building attached. They even have a little archway here that you can walk under. And here we can see some of the base stones, appearing to be some solid granite of some sort. But who knows what the exact composition of a lot of these stones are, and I'm always very impressed when I see how they're cut and fit together. As though they were designed from their very manufacture. And yes, I'm suggesting they could have been manufactured to be fit together in such a perfect format. And you see that this entire compound is very well built, and yet I suspect that it's older than this compound that we're looking at right now, because this is a latter form of construction. It's still impressive, but regardless, when you look at all this and you take in the entirety of this independent state hospital, you have to ask yourself how many people were supposed to be housed here? Now, of course, we're given a capacity number, but when you count all the surrounding buildings and the underground, how many people could you logically fit in this building? And if this building was some sort of sanctuary from a previous reset, then how much planning went into it? When you look at the rest of the grounds, you also see that. You see there's even its own water tower, and it still has its own capacity for internal infrastructure. It's an incredible facility. Yet there are many stories of terrifying things occurring in this facility in the past to many of the inmates lobotomies and other horrifying procedures. Here you even see a ventilation area from the underground tunnel. So what really to make out of this entire asylum? We find that it fits the asylum story very well, and yet the origin of this building is shrouded in mystery. We also can't understand exactly why there's virtually no construction photos of this incredible achievement in the middle of Iowa. Because remember that we're surrounded by cornfields and small towns for miles as far as the eye can see. So how difficult would it have been to bring out all these blocks? Never mind cutting them and forming them if we're to believe the mainstream account. And yet, they could stand to decorate all these windows? They could put all of this time into all of these elaborate constructions. Even though we're told that they had to build this incredible facility in a hurry. So they decided to build this, and here it still stands today 150 years later. No less impressive now than it was when they supposedly originally built it. So what do you think of the Independent State Hospital and this overall construction that's in the middle of Iowa? 
Well, you continue driving south of Independence, and of course you see vast cornfields as far as the eye can see, all the way out to the horizon. And suddenly you come upon Anamosa, the Anamosa State Penitentiary, built 1875 to 1899. Architect William Foster, did he look like one of the Douglases? Henry Franz Liebe and the architectural style, Gothic Revival and Scottish Baronial Revival. Scottish Baronial Revival? Really? <laughs> Who made that up? How did they pull that out of there? Oh, okay, never mind. We'll go on. So yes, we're told that this elaborate prison was built from the 1870s to the 1890s. And when we look at this old image of it, there seems to be something off about this image, as there usually seems to be from these older images. However, the construction of this prison and documenting it seems to be very obfuscated as well. Now, of course, it makes sense because we're told it's made of Anamosa limestone and in the nearby Stone City, Iowa, which is an unincorporated community, but it's only a few miles to the west of Anamosa, we'll be told that that's where they found all this incredible stone. Yet when you look closer at this picture, you see that it has uh, interesting considerations in and of itself, as though something about it just seems a little off. I'm not going to come out and say it, but I mean, you can draw your own conclusions. However, the origin story of this prison doesn't seem to be too absurd because of the fact that the prison was constructed of Anamosa limestone and the quarry was nearby. But somebody still had to cut all these stones, somebody still had to form them. And look at the interior of this. Recently, this prison made the news because of the hot temperatures hitting the Midwest and, frankly, the rest of the United States, has affected it as they were able to construct an incredible edifice from 1870 to 1890, but apparently it still does not have air conditioning. So the inmates are currently in a very difficult state of affairs. Yet when we look at some of the older pictures of the Anamosa State Penitentiary in Iowa, it appears as though many of the structures had already been standing for some time. But I'm sure there's somebody out there who will tell me that it was designed to be that way, that if you're going to make a state penitentiary in the 1870s, why not make it look like an elaborate castle that looks like it's out of Scotland? Ah, and here we see the work crew of what looks to be about five, and maybe that's all they needed to actually construct it, and that's why it took them 25 years. Really, I'd have trouble believing that they did this in 100 years, even if they had a construction crew of 2,500, but you know, it's for your own judgments to make. Another very interesting photograph here. And really, why do we only see this one bit of scaffolding in just five individuals? And here again, with this very rudimentary crane and this odd appearing stone, and yet we see many of the other structures and it looks like the perimeter has already been completed. So it's a very conflicted account. It's very difficult to ascertain exactly what's going on if the pictures match the story or if they were simply doing repairs because you know, perhaps there was a different origin story behind this incredible state penitentiary. However, the architecture of this state penitentiary leaves nothing to the imagination. It's a fake! It's surreal! And when you first pull up on it, you are completely taken aback by the main administration building. Why would anybody put this kind of effort into building a prison? I can understand wanting to make a prison a place that someone couldn't escape. But when you look at the beautiful architectural detail and the artistic inspiration that goes behind all of this, all of this limestone, all made, shaped, and formed to look like this. And they even throw 1898 on there, so there's no confusion exactly about when it happened, I suppose. Although we're told that the facility was around sooner, apparently this part of the facility was not around until 1898. And as if that's not enough, they also have many adornments that are also made of this beautiful limestone. And when you go and you check this to include the columns that they've also constructed on this front facade of the main administration building, you will find that it is very hard. You will find there is nothing in this entire compound that is not the real McCoy of Anamosa limestone. At least that's what we'll be told that it is. And it's strange because Anamosa limestone appears in many other constructions. And you have these nice little lions, and they're as solid as can be. And here's a close-up of the columns in the main entryway. And, of course, we have our usual little decorations, because why wouldn't you put a scary lion on a prison and a couple lions on a prison? Is that a lion or a monkey? And then you even see the floor, and it has a unique pattern to it, and the adornments around the main entryway. And of course you can see these fine blocks, everyone cut perfectly. And let's not forget the difficulty and the challenge in forming these columns and putting the decorations on them as well. 
because it's a prison, so it's going to be the most beautiful prison that anyone's ever seen. I don't know what to make of it, and when you really look at it, you're completely blown away by how it functions as a prison, and yet it displays this kind of beauty. I like all the portholes in the main wall, and then you still have parapets on each of the small towers. What exactly is the point behind that? That was never designed to have guards within these little small parapet towers. Clearly it's all decorative. And yes, it does seem to function well as a prison. Oh, yes, and let's not forget all the pillars and their decorations as well, in addition to the columns. And then even when you look on the inside of some of this special limestone, you'll find that it has crystals on the inside of it. Now, what exactly is going on here? Now, I'm aware that you can find crystals in limestone, supposedly, but it does remind me of the Crystal Empire. And yet, looking around at this vast facility, the prison is not built on top of the nearby terrain feature, which is quite fascinating. So what's exactly the story behind this place? And yet here you see it again. This very beautiful large facility that's incredibly large and every single square inch of it made of this limestone. And you even have an obelisk out in front of it, although it's stated to be a monument for the armed forces of the United States. And here you can see it looking at it from the south, looking to the north. And here once again you see all the beautiful detail. And yes, even the light posts are made out of the same limestone. It's incredible. And it's in the middle of nowhere. Anamosa is a town of 5,000 people. Anamosa has never been a large town. And yet it has this incredibly large and very beautiful prison. Although I'm sure it's not beautiful to anyone on the inside of it. And as if that's not enough, they also have this very beautiful and unique church in Anamosa. Which I would say overall is quite a unique town. And I've never quite seen a tower like that. Very fascinating. Well, this is Stone City, Iowa, population 168. It is an unincorporated community in Iowa, and this is supposedly the source of all this Anamosa limestone. And despite the fact that this is only a community of 168 people, they once had incredible buildings like this in Stone City. These are older pictures that we'll see. This is the general store. Yes, why not make a general store out of limestone? Because, you know, you're just swimming in it, so it'd be very easy just to build a building. You don't need labor. And you certainly don't need to incorporate time or logistics into it because, you know, it's written down on a piece of paper, therefore it must have happened. And why exactly is this town empty? This is part of the so-called ruins of Stone City. If this is a large quarry, and if this Anamosa limestone is being used all over the country, which we're told that it is, it's used all over the nation in the United States, why is this community so empty? Why is it so hard to find the brick production facilities while we're on the topic? Oh yes, yeah, supposedly the Anamosa limestone was used in the construction of the Disney Opera House in Los Angeles. And if you've ever seen a show there, you'll see it's a very lovely structure. <laughs> and here's what uh, they have in Missouri, and it looks like it's the same limestone, although not quite as artistically beautiful as the Anamosa State Penitentiary in Iowa. It's still very beautiful, and you know, in Missouri's defense, this was constructed a few decades earlier, so perhaps they hadn't perfected the baronial Scottish Revival style yet in Missouri, and that's why they didn't get quite as pretty of a prison as they did in Iowa. I don't know. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. So you drive south and finally you reach the beautiful Mississippi River as you head southeast to go to Keokuk from Anamosa. And it's really not that long of a drive, and along the river you see many more trees and unadulterated beauty as far as the eye can see. There's a grandeur in this Mississippi River Valley. And you finally reach the town of Keokuk in the very southeastern portion of Iowa. Founded in 1832, one of the oldest settlements in Iowa, and the population was tracked by 1850, apparently once it was incorporated. But even in these older photos, you can see what an incredibly beautiful town Keokuk was. It has an interesting story, though. Despite being at a main junction point on the Mississippi River, the population never exceeded 16,000. Yet they always had incredible locks, and you can see in these older photos they had a very well-developed infrastructure. It's a very unique story when you actually look into the history of Keokuk, though. It seemed like it was a city that was going to be destined for greatness, and you can see it in some of these structures within Keokuk. Yet for some reason, in the latter 20th century, instead of continuing to find its economy off the Mississippi River, the town turned to local industry. And it should be noted that the largest monolithic concrete dam in the world was built in Keokuk in 1913 at the time. And keep in mind, the population of Keokuk is less than what it is now. So, a very fascinating story for 
a town that wasn't that large that never became a major point on the Mississippi River, to have not just the world's largest monolithic dam, but also an incredibly large power station. And you'll see many different photos of the power station. It's the large edifice there to your left, next to the boat. And it's very interesting that the building looks a little bit different in all the older photos you look. In some older photos, it looks brand new. And in others, it looks like it's been around there a little while. So I don't know. Maybe it's one of those architectural processes that they built to just have kind of automatic aging. Or maybe it's just poor photos. This is some of the oldest remaining infrastructure that we see near Keokuk, Iowa, on the Mississippi. Very fascinating in terms of how these blocks look. How long has all this really been there? What do you think? By all means, let me know in the comments. And then, of course, going around the town of Keokuk, you'll find some very interesting structures. This is a modest Methodist church, and yet we have it surrounded by pediments and columns that are very well decorated and beautiful foundation stones. And this isn't a very large church, but it's very well built with a lot of detail. And it even has an interesting dome on the very top of it that you can't see very well in my poor camera work, but let me assure you it's there. Very well laid out, built entirely with brick. And everywhere you go in Keokuk, Iowa, you'll see old world homes such as this. Beautifully adorned with brick, with many chimneys. And it's very fascinating because you can tell that Keokuk had once been supposedly an incredible community. And clearly it was an incredible old world community. But here you see the Keokuk power plant. Again, this incredible power plant for this small town. It would probably have made more sense if they had the power plant. Here's some of the locks. It would probably make more sense if they had the power plant located further north up the river, perhaps by the Quad Cities, Davenport. Regardless, it's incredibly beautiful, and it's very well built, and it stands to this day, as does this incredible dam. A remarkable engineering achievement for 1913. Yet there's other buildings in downtown Keokuk which are quite amazing, such as the Keokuk City Hall, with a couple beautiful columns and all the beautiful ornate detail. Apparently it started as the Keokuk Savings Bank, founded in 1868. Why hide it? You may as well just say it. You know, it's what you found and you may as well use it. And of course you see some of the pillars here on the side of it. And you can see that it's surrounded by other beautiful buildings. Here are the old Keokuk National Bank with the same construction and the same construction materials because evidently it was no problem. However, there is a little bit of facading there that you can tell that's new and quite hollow when you knock on it as compared to the original hard concrete or whatever old school cement that they used there. And then here we go to yet another incredible building, the Pilot Grove Savings Bank. And you can see that this is a little taller because it wasn't enough just to have the pillars and the beautiful arch and entryway. Oh no, you needed to have a very tall building here. Because remember, this was a relatively small town. And again, you check and you look and you see exactly how formed all of this material was. Seems like a concrete or a granite, but something that's incredibly hard and very well built. And it seems like it's been unchanged for 100, 200, 300 years. And it will be unchanged for the next 1,000 years, if not longer. Now granted, that's just my impression. And here is the county courthouse that's also located in Keokuk. And you'll see that it's certainly no slouch either. Now keep in mind that this is not a very populated area. And Keokuk itself, its population, the highest it ever seemed to get was about 16,000. So the town that we were in for Spam Town was 10,000 more. Even this little pub here seems to be well built, all made with classic red brick. And when you're in the downtown of Keokuk, you're kind of staggered by the incredible buildings and the combination of materials that you see. And it just doesn't make a lot of sense for a larger building to be here, yet have this decorative ornamentation near the top. Taking a closer look at the county courthouse, uh, we see similar building styles that we've seen in other explorations, with a beautiful large clock tower on it. Although it looks like they modernized the clock with the Arabic numerals as opposed to the Roman numerals, but who knows for sure. And yet you see other beautiful facades and decorative detailing in this incredible county courthouse. And then right next to it, you'll even see that there is another sort of building. This is one of these medical centers that's just right across from the county courthouse. An interesting figure there. And you can see that this is very well built. This kind of reminds me of the one that we looked at in the exploration of Indianapolis. This isn't Indianapolis. This isn't even Des Moines. This is Keokuk in southeast Iowa. And looking at the front of the county courthouse, you can see its full beauty and all the detail that went into it. And of course, looking at the foundation stones and then the arrangement of bricks in each of the arches over the windows. 
You know, we see this so much, but we see it in places we don't expect to see it. And a small town like this in Iowa is not a place we'd expect to see it. Now, if this town had really grown, as the historical account tells us it was supposed to, then yes, this would probably make a little bit more sense. But perhaps for a town of 50,000, or 75, or 100,000, not 16,000. 1858 on the Pilot Grove Savings Bank. What do you think? When was this building really built? The date they told us, or some other date entirely? Or a year we have no idea. Now we're looking at the Johnstone Mansion, built in the 1880s. Just a random mansion I decided to pick out in Keokuk, as you can see that it's not just the city buildings, the municipal buildings, or the company buildings, or whatever you want to call them. You also have residences, and I was able to get inside this particular mansion and see some of the beautiful ornate detail on the interior. 1880s. And when you're inside this incredible house, castle, mansion, chateau, whatever you want to call it, you can see that it's adorned with incredible beautiful detail. Now, it has been renovated to be fair, and some of the materials on the inside are clearly new. But a lot of what you see on the inside is original, and it's not very difficult to verify. You can see that in the past, people lived quite differently. Now, of course, the explanation will be, well, because there were people who had a lot of money. Well, there's a lot of houses like this across the town of Keokuk. Does this really make a lot of sense? Was it just that the entire area was rich and that everybody just decided to pack their bags and leave? And you can see this here in the banister in the stairway and in the main dining room. All the beautiful trappings that we'd expect to find in the most glorious mansions that we've looked at. All these fireplaces with actual marble and carved wood around them and some very interesting figures. And no shortage of mirrors that uh, look like they're authentic as well, although some of them seem to have been replaced. Just incredible beauty. And here in the main master bedroom, we can see it all over the place. And even having the original stand for the bed, at least that's what I was informed, and you can just see how people lived in the past. Oh, I like this little figure here on the fireplace. Isn't he an interesting character? Or I don't know, maybe it's a she, or you know, we'll just say it's a creature. But very interesting carved figures around the fireplace. And again, this beautiful attention to detail and this artistic inspiration. And what's this really reflecting? What story is really being told from this incredible fireplace? And then as if that's not enough, on the same property of the Johnstone Mansion, you have this little what they call a cottage. Now, the official history says that this cottage was loaded up on a barge, and yes, as you can see, it's made of real brick, which I did verify. Somehow, they managed to load this cottage up on a barge from Fort Madison, which is up the river, and then float it down the river to Keokuk, and then place it here on the property with the Johnstone Mansion. So yeah, quite a story. And even driving up the river, as um, I came to the other side and drove up the Illinois side, because I wanted to see the town of Nuavu or Nauvoo or however it's exactly pronounced. And at Nauvoo, you have the rebuilt Church of the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Nauvoo, Illinois Temple, with the beautiful pillars and the beautiful tower. Yes, the Church of Latter-day Saints, and this is where some of their foundational history occurred, according to the historical account. Now, the story behind this temple, it was originally built in the 1840s, and you'll never guess what happened to it. We'll get to it in a second. But this one was rebuilt 1999 to 2002. And you can find some very, I'm just going to be honest here, shoddy video of its construction and planning. Now, I wasn't able to get close to verify the construction materials on this particular temple, and I wanted to be respectful. But it's interesting when you think about the fact that this supposedly looks exactly like the original temple. And it's surrounded by other churches and other edifices. And of course, you have the statue dedicated to Joseph Smith there, and you can see why this is such a beautiful area looking at the Mississippi River Valley and why someone would want to build a temple. This is certainly the spot where we'd find it, or a church. This is the original one from the 1840s, supposedly, and it looks just like the modern one, or the current one, which is <laughs> just happens to be in the exact same place, looks like this one. Now, back to what do you think happened to this temple originally? Well, I'll give you a hint. It didn't spontaneously crumble in 1910, and it didn't just suddenly fall apart. It's a story that we are quite familiar with, and it's one story that gets repeated a little often. Yep, fire. Somehow, the temple caught fire, and despite the fact that it was made out of masonry, 
At least that's what the picture would seem to indicate. Who knows, maybe it was just a wood facade, or wood facade covered in stucco, as we get with many of the World Fairs building, right? And the fire just engulfed the entire temple and reduced it to rubble, as was shown in this depiction here, as fire appears to do, especially these specified fires. So I don't know. What exactly do you think is the story behind this specific temple in Nauvoo, Nauvoo, Illinois? It was a very interesting exploration, and seeing all of these edifices and these miracles across the Midwest were quite amazing. <laughs> Burned in the fire, the temple. Thanks for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe.